Growth Pod is brought to you by Genero, a leading growth agency in the Nordics. We interview marketing experts, business leaders, and entrepreneurs to uncover the stories and strategies behind profitable growth. Today's guest is Camillo Eriksson, the co-founder and CEO of Twistshake. Twistshake is a Swedish brand that develops and sells a wide range of innovative baby products, from baby bottles to strollers. The company was founded in 2014. Uh, they've grown rapidly and their products are now available in over 70 markets around the world. Welcome to the show, Camilla. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Nice to be here. So I'd be interested to learn just starting off with the, the background. How did this, uh, how did Twistshake come about? What was the idea? Uh, so where did, did the idea for Twitter came from? Uh, it all started back in 2011 with my uh, partner, Weiner. He got to babysit for the first time and got to use a baby bottle. And this was a very cumbersome task for him. It was a lot of small parts. There was lumps in the mixture and everything like ended up in the, in, in, in the sink. Just he threw it away and said, I'm, I'm never going to do this again. Uh, he didn't think much about it at that time. He was working in real estate and construction. But one day in the middle of the in middle of the winter in 2014, he was at a construction site and saw a mother walking by with a stroller. So it's super cold mi- in the middle of the winter, snowy in, in Sweden. Uh, and the baby started crying in the stroller because it was hungry. So the mother, she reaches down to the pocket in the stroller to get the baby bottle, the plastic bag with the formula powder and the insulated bottle. And in her haste, she drops everything on the ground. And Weiner sees all of this and runs over there and helps her to get everything in order. And when they stroll away, he gets like this news flash or backflash from when he was when he was babysitting. And he said, like, he thought to himself, is it still this cumbersome to just feed your baby? And he's a pretty impulsive guy. So he decided right then and there, you know, I'm going to do something about this. Um, and he likes when things go quick. So he thought about it the entire day. And in the middle of the night, he called me and said, Camilo, I have a great idea. Uh, we're going to make a baby bottle. And I said, sure, why not? You know, let's go. Um, we had a lot of ideas and, and let's see what gets, uh, what's getting to reality. Um, and I mean, I don't think you would see him and me as kind of founders of, of a baby company. Uh, we didn't have kids. We knew nothing about sales and marketing. We had no experience in product development. And like this was just a uh, like two two small happenings in, in in random events. So the first first kind of thing we had to to understand is that is there an actual need for like improving the way that you feed your baby with baby bottles? So what we did is we we gathered a group of parents, roughly one hundred parents, uh, to get insights into the market. Started asking those simple questions: What are the main problems with feeding your baby with a baby bottle? And what we realized is that uh, there were lumps in the lumps in the mixture, uh, a lot of small parts, hard to clean. There was no easy way to carry around like fruits, biscuits, formula powder when you're on the go. And like we looked at it then and realized, okay, these are pretty like trivial issues to fix, right? It's 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 not something hard. I think we we already had ideas on how to how to fix it. And baby bottles has been around for 40, 50 years, and they've always looked the same. Uh, they've been marketed with a like from a doctor's office, and we quickly realized, you know, these guys they're not listening to the consumer. They're they're not like they're so far away from the market that they don't uh, take input. So like what what we had managed to do in a month uh, was to find actual problems, a gap gap in the market, a, a product that we could tr- or at least try to <laughs> to to bring to reality. Um, and, and, and that's kind of how all, all everything started. We also looked at the, at the baby bottles and saw like they haven't changed much in 40, 50 years. Um, and they look very like sterile and boring. And we wanted to make something that was more in line with like today's fashion, fashion expectations on, 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 on products. And also something that you wanted to show something that you wanted to, um, kind of have as part of your life, you know, more, more than just something that you need. So I think that's the that's the summary. That's how we started, and from then we've been going full on. <laughs> uh, 
uh, every day, uh, putting our hearts and, and, and passion into this, this project. And it's, it's turned out uh, really, really nice. That's pretty incredible. We, you know, you did not have the personal experience of, you know, having babies, but you took this very systematic empirical approach and found the, the market gap and, and, and how it wasn't served by existing, existing solutions. So how, what were the first, the early days like, was this just an immediate success? You brought the baby bottle to market, parents loved it, or how, what were the first year or, or so like? I think the, 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 the first, at, at least three years, we did nothing else but this, uh, like, I think we, we always put really, like we try, try to put ourselves in a corner where we don't really have a choice than to just go ahead. So I think I remember when we went to Far East to, to do the first production wider, you know, he, he ordered 100,000 baby bottles to begin with. That was the first order. <laughs> so, so we did, we didn't really have, a, have an option. Um, so when, when we actually launched the brand, uh, we, you know, as a new started company, we didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of products. Uh, so it was pretty evident what we were supposed to do. But I think uh, the first three years was um, was just a lot of lot on a focus on uh, sales and marketing, and also like like I said at the beginning, we as we didn't have kids, we had just uh, researched the baby bottle. But when we first started approaching stores, you know, we we had a baby bottle. And our, our competitors they had full ranges of products, like 40, 30 to forty products. Why would they take in a colorful baby bottle and like? take a brand out that they've been having for 40, 50 years. So we also realized, you know, in order to be competitive on the market, but also uh, like feel trustworthy to the consumer, because like you're, you're, you're starting a family. This is a lot of responsibility. You're putting a lot of weight into the trust of the brand that you're choosing for your baby. And we, we looked at it and said, like, we, we look pretty weak uh, just having a baby bottle. So we put a lot of focus into product development as well, um, and and have launched I think five to fifteen original design products each year. Like what we've done in the baby industry is, is, is has never ever happened on planet Earth that, at this at this rate of development. But yeah, going back to the early days, I think uh, any 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 new started business, uh, the thing you have is time, and the more time you invest into your project, hopefully the better it would be. I think what, what you see in a new startup company is that you have a lot of flexibility and that's your advantage. You can, you can change quick. You can redesign the company if you want to in a day. <laughs> Maybe that's not the best thing, but in the beginning, you really have to try and you have to try and try and try and find what works for you. And what worked for us was really, this was in the, not in the, most earliest earliest stages, but it was in the earlier stage of influencer marketing where people had a lot of blogs. So you didn't call them influencers, you call them bloggers. And uh, since we didn't have any, I mean, our, our idea was that we just put Twitchek on the market and it's going to sell by itself and, 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 you know, we don't have to work anymore. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, that wasn't really the case. So, but we had a lot of products, like we said, we ordered 100,000 baby bottles. So we started giving out baby bottles to baby to, to bloggers and ask them, you know, uh, would you like to try our new product? This, these are the advantages or this is how it works. Please try it and give us like your honest review. Like, just tell us what you think. Um, we don't want to prove anything. We just want to know what you think. And, and that's kind of how we started working a lot with influencer marketing. So earlier days, you wake up in the morning, 7 a.m. You're at the office and then you go home and 12 o'clock in the night, and then it's just seven days a week, no stop. That's how it was, I think, for the first three years, to be honest. How did you, you know, not burn out from this, just the amount of work that you had to do, but also the massive risk taking, like, did that not feel scared or to order 100,000 baby bottles, not knowing who's going to buy them? Like, how did you, how did you cope with this personally and mentally? I think, you know, this is something that really pushes, I, I'm sp speaking for myself now, I can speak somewhat maybe for Viner, but I think this is really what we have to put in a lot of 
like we're, we're have high stakes people you know if 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 they're not if it's if the stakes are not high enough it's not interesting enough so in order to 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 get your full attention you kind of want to put all the other temptations out the window and and one way you can do that is just to invest everything you have like i put everything i had in, into this sold everything i had moved into a small apartment and just yeah lived at the office basically and um I think, I mean, if looking at burning out and, and stuff like that, I mean, of course there are tough times, but at the end of the day, like as long as you can, you know, feel like that, that the amount of time you're putting into it is, is, is giving you something back and, and, and you can live on that and you see what you're doing today actually is something that you can build up on tomorrow which makes it a lot more meaningful. And then you have to, of course, also see, see to yourself, if I'm putting, putting on too much stress so that I would burn out, I will, you know, what will happen to the company? I have a responsibility. I cannot, you know, treat myself in whatever way I like. Even if I work a lot, that doesn't, it doesn't mean that you will burn out. There's not a one-to-one. -one. I think there's a lot of other factors such as stress or like the way you feel about yourself. So that's, that's kind of what we did. We just put all everything out the window and just focused on one thing, one thing only. And um, yeah, I mean, that worked out apparently. You don't know until you try, right? <laughs> so, I think you made a really good point that it's about understanding yourself. Like you said, you're a person. Yeah, it has to be kind of extreme, high stakes, all in for it to be interesting. That gets your attention, and and so you kind of set you you painted yourself like you said in a corner. There was only one way out, and that was through like just a massive amount of hard work and taking risk. Exactly, and I, I mean, this is not this is before Twishik as well. I, I, I kind of realized about myself that, uh, like, if, when you go to school, like you you every you have your teachers, you have people that look out for you. They want to follow up with you every six months or every year. You have grades. Some will tell you you did a good job or you did something bad. And then, you know, when you graduate or whatever you do, you get out in life and everything is on you, right? So I, I, I kind of looked at those things and said, okay, if I, if I commit to someone, if I say, you know, I promise you I will do this, then I will feel a sense of purpose, even though whatever this thing might be, it's, it's, it's more meaningful than just saying, oh, I want to become the, the greatest uh, X, Y, Z, or I'm going to do this, because you don't have that. Kind of commitment you can you can make a commitment to yourself but i think at the end of the day um you have to find that motivation that drive that really makes you go up in the morning if it's just for yourself you know i want I'm, i said to my wake up this morning i said like i'm gonna clean today am i gonna clean today probably not but if i promise my mother you know i'm gonna clean today i'm probably gonna do it you know so it's 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 those kind of easy you have to have like easy systems and processes for yourself in order to achieve what you want to achieve at the end of the day, right? Absolutely. I want to go back to something you mentioned in the early days, you were launching like a dozen products or so new products every year. Uh, product launches, that's really difficult for a lot of companies. There's a lot of failures and it takes a long time. So can you talk about the process? If you had a process for it, you mentioned some how you approach it with uh, baby bottles, but did you kind of formalize? A, a, a process for product development or how did you think about it in the early days? So, I mean, we, we weren't a lot of people in the beginning. I mean, we kind of at, at the end of three years, I think we were 10, 15 people at the company. I mean, I, I mean, that worked with kind of the business. I mean, for, for us, we have always done everything ourselves. Uh, that's been kind of the, the end goal. And I think just for product development, it's, it's been me and Viner has focused a lot on that, uh, trying to get like what we wanted to create is 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 to bring in innovation into each qual uh, uh, into each category that we went into. So, you know, fortunately, with babies, like everybody is following kind of the same path. You know, you're born and then you need help eating, and then you go into cups, you go into uh, tableware cutlery and stuff like that. So it's pretty much the same journey for for every baby. So it was very easy for us to understand what do we need to make like what kind of categories do we need to develop or 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 to have products within to fit like the entire baby's life and we focus from like zero to four years that's been our our uh, target 
audience, so to speak. It's not an audience, like it's the parents, but uh, but products for babies is zero to four years old. And I think in the beginning it was a lot about uh, what what we actually made was like designing original designing our own products and I think at, in the beginning of a company you don't have a lot of money to to go and put against uh, product development so we were fortunate I, I mean I had some experience in, in 3D CADing and we took a lot of help from uh, from our manufacturers and also worked a lot with the uh, partner we had in Stockholm but at the end of the day it was a lot of, a lot about finding time um, to to look at each category see okay how can we make this category stand out how can we add something into this category uh, that creates a meaning that adds a value like real a real added value to the parents so it's it's always been about it's always been about that so like the second product we launched was the was the sippy cups where we have a mixer that acts as an instant fruit infuser so the whole idea about this is that you know of course you want to give water to your babies or or, or toddlers but at the end of the day, they gotta they they want to have something tasty. They want to have something different. You don't want to give these um, uh, juices with added sugars and stuff like that. So we said, okay, can we make something different? We looked at the the uh, fruit, fruit, fruit infuser, so you could put put in your fridge, but they were very slow. You didn't have a lot of fun with it. So we developed and patterned our own like mixing solution for it. So you just shake the bottle. You have instant fruit and flavor, fruit flavored water. So it's been a lot about that, like trying to find the main issue, main problem, and and a solution for that within every product category. And that's why I think we've been so successful in, in product development. And this has stayed with the company since since our first idea. And did you like early on or, or still to this day try to quickly find a problem, create a prototype, get it out to like a test group of users? Or how do you make sure that, that process is as quick as possible? And that you don't waste time on products that are not going to have that kind of broad appeal that you're looking for. I mean, f- first of all, we we look at. I mean, is this a pro- is this a product that every baby would need or all parents would need? We're we're not we're. I mean, looking at babies is a niche category. You know, we're trying to find parents with baby like pra- pregnant mothers or parents with babies zero to four years old. This is already a, like dividing a market or or fighting. A, it's a niche. So trying to find niches within the niche, uh, that's really not going to work out for us. That's something we realized early. So number one, we're always looking for products that's going to fit the entire uh, target audience. Everybody uh, needs it. Like we say, it's a must have. It's not a need to have. It's a must have. Um, and after that, I mean, we've become better at this. We now i think also we utilize tools such as uh, like looking into marketplaces looking at google searches i think uh, our la- latest product uh, the bath stand is actually a result of us uh, looking into search history and search um, and it was actually our sem uh, a, a consultant that recommended us oh guys you know people are actually googling the twishek bathtub uh, the twishek bathtub stand um, there seems to be a gap in the market and we said my god it's so evident let's do it um, but after that like you said of course you know we after we've decided ourselves we really put our hearts into it and want to try and make something really quick and then it's about getting it into a, a, a test group of parents uh, having them try it out making adjustments and then getting it on the market as soon as possible that's that's really true, right? There's so much data out there. If you know how to access this, access it, access it, and interpret it, customers are essentially always telling us with their behavior, search, or or otherwise, what they're looking for. So it's not really you don't really need to guess. Exactly, and I think also that, I mean, we put I don't know how many thousands of hours into into only baby, so you become. You know everything, you know all the competitors, you know all the products that are, that are out there, uh, you see and you follow trends, so you become a, you, be, you need to become a nerd in what you're doing. And I mean, I, I don't have kids today, but I, I, I know everything that's going to happen month by month, you know, so you really, I think that's also a, a big part in it. You have to know your, your vision, what you're trying to create. For us, it's always been making life easier for parents and then knowing a lot about what you're trying to do and trying to achieve. Totally. So 
the day if if when you have children you'll be completely prepared because you'll know everything about <laughs> what they yeah I, I mean i know what's gonna happen i don't know how it, how it is but like yeah now we have month three this is what's supposed to happen let's see whatever happens we'll see so going back to what you mentioned with influencer marketing uh early before instagram kind of took off it was about the blogs and you you did that um, you've also done influencer marketing at a huge scale when it comes to Instagram. So I'd be curious to kind of, if you could talk about the the process and some of the results and how you approach it, because a lot of companies, they do it, maybe, maybe they look at influencer marketing as a branding, as opposed to something that will drive actual sales and they just allocate a little bit, but you have had a, I think quite unique approach that I'd be curious to, to learn about. Yeah. I think you, you speak to more, more people than I do, but I mean. Uh, our approach has been like from from the beginning we we quickly realized like uh, we sent our products we didn't have a lot of data or insights or anything like that but we saw spikes in traffic on our website so we saw that you know this is actually something that's creating interest people are looking at the products reading about them visiting visiting our website and and I mean at the end of the day trying out our products um, so you know I think we do we did us a lot of other company do you start in an Excel file and you start to try and, and 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 manage all of this but like I have I have a lot of respect for 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 anybody doing influencer marketing and like succeeding with it it's a lot to keep track on like you know you cannot just work with one influencer you have to work with I don't know tens hundreds thousands of them and then control that so it's 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 really a lot about and, and making sure that you contact them in the right way that you uh, send them products that you follow up with them. Everything is scheduled, and it's it's. We saw it as a process. I think in the beginning, that's one part of it. Of course, it's 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 not everything, but one part of it was the process. And when we were when we were smaller, or, or in the beginning, we just had one person. Her name is Elin. She's still with the company, driving the entire sales team right now. Amazingly, uh, and. Uh, like when when it was just her working with this, it was easy. But when we had two people trying to enter the same Excel file at the same time, it became a problem. So you had uh, influencers that were contacted by the same people, and it's just like it didn't really look good from from our standpoint. So we decided then, uh, like, how do we fix this? And I I have some background in programming, so I said I will build a system. And everybody asked like, okay, how long time is this going to take? I said it's four days. Uh, I actually, I, it took 30 days, like 16 hours a day, but <laughs> so you, you know, you underestimate yourself or, or overestimate yourself. And at, at the end of those 30 days, we had like this system that we call Twistnet, and it's still something that we use for, for influencer marketing today. So it, it, it allows you to have better control, um, almost a real time follow up on sales, like that are generated through the influencers that we work with. And, and it, it gave us kind of a, a, a process, a method of working, a way to measure ourselves, a way, a way to improve, okay, what's working, what's not working, and, and a kind of a language, like a, a, a language around it. So you create a, a, a culture and, and, and a system and a process, and as long as you really go for it, I think you can, you can do this with whatever you want. So I think that's one of our one of the corner blocks in into making influencer marketing successful, and and I, I think also in terms of building the team, we've we've always strived for people that are very result oriented. Uh, so if you can follow your sales every five minutes, you see what works and what doesn't work. You get this kind of uh, reward feeling. Okay, I made something good here. Okay, let's do more of that. Or you know, this didn't really work out. Okay, let's try something different. And then that's that's how we've we've developed it. I think that's really interesting. Um, the fact that you didn't kind of accept what I think most companies do is they accept that okay, this is going to be hard to measure. We're just going to see it as an investment in the brand. You actually went about building a system that will give you the feedback, so you can make improvement, but also you, so you can make those huge investments because I know you built a really big team and you you've done this at a huge scale. Um, and I, I think I know it goes back to you're a very analytical person and kind of also extreme as we talked about in the beginning. So if you if you see that something's working, you want to push that kind of take it to the extreme. So I'd be interested to learn if you guys have done approach have had a similar approach in other areas like when it comes to retail, when it comes to digital advertising, 
are you kind of always looking to create a system where you get feedback and and so you always know what's what's kind of working like how do you have you taken a similar very systematic result oriented approach to all your marketing efforts I think what what we said in the beginning was that okay um let's fo- let's let's find a few things that we are really really good at or something that we want to become really really good at and then and and the three things that we aligned around was number one was developing developing good products and that's something that we achieved number two was focus a lot on influencer marketing and then we also said like offline sales so those were the kind of the three pillars that we focused on and spent most of our time on i mean you can you can do uh, like you can branch out and do millions of things in a company, but we, we said, okay, we're not experts in, in any of these areas. I mean, let's focus on three things and become really, really good at that. And when we become bigger, we can, we can expand into different things, but this is going to be the backbone of, of twist shake. So I think, I mean, of course you can apply it like measurements, analytics and, and so on. Uh, but to the extent that we've done with influencer marketing and stuff I, I mean it's you have now eight hours a day five 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 days a week right so even if you add on a lot of people you still have to it takes a lot of time to build that culture around how you look at things and how you evaluate and how you how you it's one the, one one thing to build a system i think a lot of people could do that but how do you make that into a a way of working how do you make that into celebrations how do you build a team around it and that takes time. So, but yeah, I mean, of course we, we have a lot of numbers. I, I mean, sometimes we have a lot, I, I think a bit too many numbers, but I, th- I think all, a lot of them make sense. And, and it is about, I mean, trying to give a good overview on, on what to do next. I think that's, that's, that's the ambition and allowing people on, on speaking the same language and having kind of a, a consensus into what, what are you doing? What are you measuring? I think it's really interesting. No, it makes a lot of sense. I think it's really interesting that you quite early on, it sounds like you were able to identify like these are the three things that we're going to focus on and we're going to do it over and over and over again and get better and better at it. And well, that's a couple of other things as well. But this is the, this is kind of the playbook that we're going to run. I feel like that's, that's a huge competitive advantage because a lot of companies are dabbling and, you know, maybe there's a new CMO or CEO who wants to do his or her own thing. So very few companies I feel have that continuity uh, that you've been doing, like you've been doing influencer marketing for years and years and years. You develop this sophisticated process that I think it would be almost impossible at this point for your competitors to copy. Um, so it feels like it's a huge competitive advantage to have that kind of focus and uh, continuity. Yeah, it's, it, that's, that's, I think that's pretty much it. And of course, you know, as we become a bigger, bigger company, you have to do uh, more things and, and expand upon that, but you have to really understand what's your bread and butter, what's like the, the own, the, the three things or four things or whatever, whatever it is that you decide upon that always have to work, uh, because that's the foundation of the business. Something that you've been very successful at is expansion, international expansion. And that's something that a lot of companies struggle with for you know, it's, it's very difficult for a lot of reasons. So, uh, what do you think, what do you kind of prescribe that, describe that, uh, success to like, what has allowed you to succeed successfully go to new market after new market? I think, uh, this is, we, we, in the beginning, we looked at it as, as sales. So imagine, um, trying to sell and selling baby products in Sweden, right? You have 200 baby stores, that's it. Uh, so we, we called through them in two months, I think. And after that, you have Ica, you have the big supermarkets and the pharmacies, and they don't want to talk to you unless you have two years in the market, whatever. So, I mean, after two months, uh, nobody in the baby industry wanted to talk to me anymore uh, because they were, they were tired, they don't, I mean, they're not going to say yes, even if I call tomorrow, but uh, so then we set sales on, you know, babies are the same in any market, right? So there's, there's no real big difference. I think uh, we, when we actually launched the product, we started calling, like just cold calling on, on markets in Europe and trying to see like, is there anyone uh, that wants to bring on the brand, everything from retailers to uh, distributors and, and, and everything like that. And that's kind of how we've done 
our international expansion from from kind of a business to business standpoint. And I think, like we've also talked to a lot of like Business Sweden or Almi or you know everybody's trying to make it complicated. I think it's about understanding the risk. Like what risk are you willing to take to do international expansion? Um, of course, there are culture differences, but I mean at the end of the day. You're going to sell a brand, you're going to sell products. That's the same everywhere you go. So I, I think what made us succeed, I think by the end of the first year, we were in 14 countries. End of year two, we were in 45 countries. It's like, don't make it too hard. Like it's, it's about putting the hours into it. And if, if you're, if you're trying to overcomplicate things, uh, you're not really going to have time to spend on what you really need to spend time on. And then in, if you talk about sales is is outreach like how do you reach enough people how do you find them how do you convert them how do you make them interested in the brand and that's what you need to focus on and then you can decide how much risk do you want to take do you want to sell on with payment terms or what what do you want to do like that's 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 up to you but if this is the right way or the wrong way i don't know uh you can do it in in different ways what we did is that we said okay let's 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 go wide in terms of expansion in the beginning uh, that's made us very successful in a lot of countries uh, where we haven't actually had to take a lot of risk. We built with partnerships and with distributors in South America, in, in GCC, in Southeast Asia and so on. And then in, in Europe, we focused a lot on our, our own activities, such as like marketing with the, the influencers and so on, with our own uh, B2C. I don't know if that's an answer, but I think in terms of international expansion, you can do it in a different, uh, uh, a bunch of different ways. What we've done is we've gone in traditionally with with our offline business first. If it had, if it didn't didn't work, uh, we also expanded with online. But the online is limited by the logistics for us. I mean, if we cannot, if we we cannot ship to the US from Sweden, that's gonna ruin the the PNL completely. So it's it's not really an option. If we want to go there, you know, then we have to do a lot of investments, and then it's about risk taking again. I think it's really refreshing to hear someone say that it doesn't have to be that complicated and you can actually just look at it quite simply, take a small, uh, figure out kind of how much risk you're willing to take and then just go for it. Yeah. And I think, I mean, we've, I think there are, uh, like different things for, for everything. I mean, if, if you're a smaller company as well, you don't have that, uh, maybe those muscles that you need to go in hard, like you do a Red Bull in, in, in Sweden, you know, <laughs> that's out of the question. So you have to work with what you have. And we're a self-funded company, like, or we have not entirely. I mean, we have, we, we took in an investor in 2018, but I mean, that was not for the, for the cash induction. It was more about finding structure and finding like that, uh, teacher I was talking to you about in the beginning, someone who can push him and poke at you. Uh, but you have to work with the means that you have. I, that's that's from our point of view. And if, if you don't want to do that, then you, you know you need to raise capital and 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 do it in a different way. So I think it's it's all about that kind of risk taking. And if you don't know how much risk you want to take, you should start there and see what does it mean. Yeah, I, I think... want to become number one brand in in every country in the world. Yeah, okay, <laughs> let's break it down. Exactly. I think. Uh... The twist Jake story is a great story of like great example of how constraints create creativity. Uh, we don't have a lot of money; you need to be creative. Um, I'd be curious to 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 kind of um, talk about the, the the current environment has been really difficult for a lot of e-commerce direct to consumer brands. Um, demand is kind of going down across a lot of sectors or a lot of in, uh, segments, and customer acquisition costs have been been kind of going up, and so getting getting the unit economics to work has been a struggle for a lot of, a lot of companies. How have you been thinking about improving profitability and what are some of the concrete ways that you've gone about it? You mentioned, um, off, off air that you focused a lot on, on raising average order value. That's been successful and kind of the key. Yeah. I, I think also for us, um, like you might, it's, it's been crazy years, like with our, our business split was like 50, 50, our only com uh, and, and offline, online, offline, if that's how we put it in before, uh, pre COVID and then COVID hit. So 50% of our business is kind of go away or, you know, we have to treat it differently. 
And then after that, we had uh, the container price issues uh, where containers went from like $2,000 to fifteen dollars to $18,000. And we have pretty bulky goods. So, I mean, this, this situation right now that we're in, I, it's, it's never been as good as it is now, like in the last four years. Uh, from 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 that point of view, where you have to be creative or where you have to be more profitable. I mean, we've taken huge hits from um, macro trends and like pandemics and then inflation. Like inflation is like the what I'm trying to say is like the inflation thing is from my perspective like it's the least complicated thing that's happened over the last few years. Uh, but of course, it still it still it still it still affects us. Um, but yeah, I mean, trying to find profitability. I, I think what we realized at the end of um, we we work a lot with margins. We look at cost of sale, gross margin one, gross margin two, gross margin three, and so on. Uh, one exercise that we we definitely forgot about is to look at the actual like like the hard figure like because you can you, we had an amazing cost of sale like what we thought on on getting in new customers but at the end of the day we didn't find profitability in the online channel and what it really uh, what it really was about is that we had a very low average of the value so we sell a baby bottle pacifiers like cups and stuff like that everything is uh, below 10 euros and if you weigh in shipping that's around you know five to eight euros if someone orders a baby bottle from you uh, you've got to be like going back in time that's kind of like how we thought about it like okay this order makes us go back in time if the customer doesn't come back so we said okay let's try and make everything profitable let's try and make every order profitable and find strategies to uh, to see to that we can still have all customers happy so we went from, I think, an average order value, we doubled the average order value in, in less than four months. And we actually lost like 40% of all orders, but we increased the revenue by, by 10%. So, and, and we also saw, um, since we, we reduced the number of orders on, on our own online, we saw the, the stores and, and our partners growing quicker. So we were pretty much saying no to certain customers because and, and then they found the products in, in other avenues, such as going to the stores and where, where there is no shipping cost, so to, so to be. And, and that's also like, uh, looking back at it, it was a pretty like <laughs> big decision to take, but sometimes we, we didn't really test it. We didn't really do anything. We just said, okay, it's a hard stop. Now we're gonna change from one direction to the other, but it was, it's it's also about like the risk taking again like we were willing to take the risk we were willing to say okay let's go for this uh, we're not going to look back we're not going to change this is the new reality and if you look at it that way instead of like oh let's try it a bit let's go back let's you know not everyone is behind it you're, you're not going to go anywhere no that's interesting do you think that you know certainly this Going back to what you said uh, in the beginning of the podcast is when you're a young company, you can change direction overnight. Has that gone harder now that you're a much, much bigger organization? And how have you kind of tried to create a culture of people who are have that kind of risk appetite that, you know, you, you have personally? How have you gone about creating that culture? Yeah, I, I don't necessarily think that it's a good idea to have uh, more people with that kind of risk appetite. <laughs> I think you'd like that. If you have a bowl that that bowl fills pretty quickly uh, because it's easy to come up with ideas and take risks that it's, it's not a hard thing it's like making sure you follow through and, and actually apply them uh, but i mean of course like i said we focused on the three things uh, organization was not one of them in the beginning and i think uh, looking back at it and um, like in the beginning you, you really need to put a lot of man like hours into it to make a difference but then it comes kind of a tilting point where your hours doesn't really matter as much as they did before and then you have to realize like it's it's not it's 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 becoming something bigger it's becoming like you said a culture a, a organization that needs to work and that needs to flourish and i mean i think i've done hopefully uh, the majority of the mistakes that you can do in the book uh, but we will see the future is to tell and um, I mean 
it's it's uh, I think it's a different uh, it's a different way of working with people than working with like strategies. Like there's there's one way. I mean, I'm very good with numbers, very analytical, and they don't have emotions, right? They don't have they don't have anything to say to you or like working with a computer is guys gonna be what it is but when you start working with people you have to put it up in, in different ways and we've actually like now I think we've managed really good I mean to have a strong management team that have a really like a strong passion for management and leading people and 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 then you have to listen to that and understand what steps needs to be taken in what order maybe you cannot change things overnight but if you can be satisfied we're changing things over like a a, a a time period, then I mean, everybody gets what they want, right? So I think that's what we've, I, I mean, from my side as well, I definitely have grown and, and, and understood that. Um, and you also have to reflect about that. There's not, you're not gonna make a switch in a, in a bigger company that's gonna change like the business. Like there's, there's very few things that you can do. Um, that's not going to have like a really, really big impact on the business. So I think in the beginning also, like you, you, you don't really have those income streams. You don't know how, how the business is doing. So it becomes easy for you to switch. Like there's no risk in it, but looking at it right now, if I were to make something up tonight when I dream of something and, and go to the and tomorrow, let's say, let's switch direction completely, you know, it's, it's not going to work. And that's not necessarily something you want to do. So now you have to work it through. You have to, uh, and I think that's good, really good. Yeah, it really speaks to kind of also your role as a CEO that you need to, you have your personality and your personal strengths, but you have to evolve with the organization and you have to be just constantly learn and, and reevaluate. <sighs> Absolutely. Like, and, and, and also sorry. taking people that you like that, that necessarily doesn't work like you or have the same ideas or uh, you have to you have to find different people and the combination of all of that that's what's going to make make the success going stronger and that's i think also what makes it a lot more fun um so not a lot of fun to succeed alone it's when you have people with you and you can do it together absolutely camilo it's been uh, it's been a, rough, a lot of fun learning about learning about twist shake and, and and the origins and the story um, for people who want to follow, of course, you can go to Twist Shake and, and get all the baby baby products if you have a child between the ages of zero to four. Absolutely. Uh, follow wait, us any, on Instagram. We're the biggest us. baby brand in the world. So become one of our followers. You have to follow that journey. And it, for people who want to follow you specifically, is that LinkedIn? Or are you active on any, any other? Do you have a baby blog? People can follow us at LinkedIn. Oh, no, I, I don't. So it's LinkedIn. I'm not a frequent poster, so like to work in the dark, you know? Okay. So, well, you know, maybe people can start prodding you and, and to get you to start sharing more, more frequently, because I think that would be really beneficial. Absolutely. Um, thanks a lot, Camilla. Have a great, uh, great rest of the day. And thank you so much. Thank for you too, out. Joshua. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. You can find all episodes of The Growth Pod on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts.